Hi guys, thanks for this episode of Nick Egan Times. On this episode we have an awesome guest, we have Tommy Vext. Tommy is a multi-talented heavy metal singer and songwriter. Tommy is well known as the former lead vocalist of Bad Wolves and Westfield Massacre. Tommy is currently touring and doing amazing music. Uh, welcome Tommy, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks Nick, thanks for having me. You're welcome. How's it all been going over there? Uh, it's okay. I mean, it's I'm in Los Angeles, so uh, things are relatively normalized here. You know, uh, we still have some some kind of restrictions going on as far as I think there are certain neighborhoods where restaurants and gyms are requiring COVID um, pass, uh, I guess, vaccine passports or whatever. But most of the county is not uh, is not doing that. So. And you, you're in, what part of Australia are you in? I'm in Sydney. So we just recently came out of lockdown as of Monday. So we were in lockdown for about three or four months where we couldn't leave uh, our houses unless exercise. Uh, so I don't know how you guys have done it. I, I feel like the, like Australia's had some of the most severe lockdowns on the planet. Yeah, it's been crazy. It's um, been extremely tough like, to get through it. But I'm just glad personally that. We're out of it, you know, go to the bar and have a drink and stuff and have dinner and <laughs> just do normalized things again. Yeah. Do you know, have they said when you guys are clear for international travel and stuff? Uh, yeah. So they're looking at um, December, mid-December. Um, we can start traveling again. Um, okay. So that's really exciting. So definitely going to start doing traveling and go to the States um, next year. Um, the only thing is, though, we've got to do still seven-day home quarantine. So, for example, uh-huh. if you're going to go overseas for, say, a week, um, and you come back, you still got a home quarantine for seven days. So, I guess you've got to weigh out, like, if you're going to go overseas, you want to do it for a long time, or, like, a little while anyway, to justify being locked up again for seven days. Yeah, and so, are you guys, do they make you quarantine at home? Because I saw some videos where people were staying at hotels. Yeah, so for, since we've obviously had the pandemic hit, we've always had 14 days um, quarantine, and that was actually mm-hmm. now you have to pay that out of your pocket. The government subsidized it, subsidized it initially, um, but then they brought in, if you're going to go do quarantine and come back, you have to do 14 days inside a hotel. Um, they're cool. actually going to remove that now because we've hit our target of currently 70% vaccination rate uh, across uh, New South Wales, the state that I'm in. Um, okay. And they're going to, when we do the uh, international borders opening again, we're going to have to do seven days home quarantine. Oh, okay, I gotcha. So, that's, not too, that's not too rough. I, Hawaii was kind of doing the same thing because, I mean, the the islands have to, be, have to be more strict about what's coming in and out. And so I, I guess they were, Hawaii was doing a 14 day for most of the year, and now I think it's down to a few days. Um, with a with a negative test, so wow. it's everywhere's different. You know, you go to Texas, like you know, I've been I've been touring this whole year, and so you know, Texas is just it's like nothing happened. Florida is like nothing happened. Um, you know, most the Dakotas, I think it's it's just a lot. Like it, I think that it's more. I, I think the nature of COVID is a little bit more scary for people who live in big cities because there's so much a so much condensed population in one spot, and then you know obviously people who live in cities and public transportation there's a higher uh, possibility of people getting sick. So it's just been interesting to see the different places how it's affected people differently. Hundred percent. So even um, in Australia. We can, we actually, but there's actually, it's going to happen. We'll be able to travel overseas. So, for example, I'll be able to come to the States in after mid-December if I wanted to, but I wouldn't be able to go to Queensland, which is another state, because they're fully blocked it off from um, any travel interstate within Australia. It's just crazy how it's all, every state and every place has its own, I guess, um, procedure of what can come in, what can't get out. Yeah, I mean, I have friends who live in Melbourne, and, and they said they they had, like, over 200 days of lockdown. It's crazy, eh? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even... That's almost a year, you know? That's, <laughs> that's, you lose a whole year of your life inside. It's, like, kind of crazy. Yeah, they got the record for the longest um, the longest place on the planet for having lockdown you know, since the pandemic's begun. Yeah, I, I've, saw, I've seen there's been some 
on on the on Instagram and Facebook, people have been posting. There's been like some pushback and like people like I think it was the the construction workers union. Like they want to go back to work, and you know, it's a weird time. What a time to be alive. Yeah. Um, how as I guess on a personal and I guess your professional um, life, how has the pandemic affected you? Oh, uh, I mean a lot. I, I mean. You know, I've, I'm in, in the, the next two weeks, I go into, uh, I'm in a lawsuit. I sued my record label and, um, and my former business partner in Bad Wolves over discrimination and, um, a, a multitude of different things. We had very, uh, a difference of political opinions. And then they kind of went about trying to separate me from the band in a way that was illegal and they got caught. So, we're trying to hammer all those details out in court in the next two weeks. Cause those guys, they want to move, you know, they want to put out a record with another singer. They actually stole a bunch of my songs, which is another thing that we're kind of arguing over because the bands bad and bad wolves, nobody in the band plays on the records except me and the drummer. So there's a, we have a studio guitar player named Max that does a lot of the heavy writing. And then I work with a couple other different producers on, on the songs that are kind of autobiographical about my life. So there's been a huge issue since the company and the band is, is more like Nine Inch Nails. So it's, it's affected a lot, you know, and it's, it's, you know, I've been very outspoken. I have, you know, my opinions and stuff, uh, and I respect everyone else's beliefs. And I think that the problem in America in 2020 is we didn't have enough open dialogue. Um, and obviously our election, it was like, you know, you guys watch it. It's like one of the craziest election years in our modern history. Um, so it was very divisive, you know, and I think people got too invested in what party instead of what was best for the country, you know? Yeah, for sure. Where, where do you see the United States, um, headed going into the future of everything that's happening in your opinion? What do I think is going to happen? Yeah. I think that, uh, I think China is going to be the new world power eventually. I think it's a matter of time. Um, I think that our country is, I think Joe Biden is, is, uh, I don't think that it's fair that he is being pushed to do all this stuff and, and uphold office because I think it's obvious that he's, he's in his older years and he needs, he needs to be in care, you know, and, and, I get it. You know, it's an honor to become the president, but you have to kind of decide on taking care of your health and living out the rest of your years, uh, you know, in a way that's peaceful to you than, than, um, constantly having this guy who's, you know, I think it's obvious to everyone in the world that, you know, we know he's not in charge, but they, they should have some decency and, and let him have a rest. You know, he's, he did his time. He's, he was, you know, he's a vice president. He's been in politics for 40 years. Like, he, he deserves a rest. It's enough is enough, you know? So I, I think that other countries like Russia and China are looking at us as very weak now as a result of Joe Biden's mental and emotional, um, uh, just his state, you know? So, and then I, you know, obviously, I don't think he'll make it through the four terms and, We'll have to pray that Kamala Harris does a good job for the nation, uh, but there's kind of a bit of a, you know, there's a there's a lot of a lack of faith in the Democrats because they promised a lot of things and didn't deliver any, and they've kind of been making matters worse and worse and worse and worse. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's really insightful. Thanks for sharing. All right, let's just um, jump straight into it. Talk to me about. Well, take us back to where you grew up and how, I guess, you got into the heavy metal scene and even how you got the name Tommy Vex. How did all that transpire? Uh, well, I mean, I grew up in South Brooklyn. Um, you know, my I'm, I'm a twin, and my brother and I, my mom was a crackhead, and she abandoned us when we were born. And so uh, we wound up getting, uh, we got we both got adopted together, so we got to grow up together, so that was uh, advantageous to a degree. And, um, you know, my father was a Vietnam veteran. My mom was a stay at home, uh, stay at home mom. 
And we live in South Brooklyn and, you know, we didn't have very much. You know, my dad was a working class guy. He was a janitor trying to feed a family. And he, I think I inherited his work ethic. He'd sometimes work two and three jobs just to, just to make ends meet and to get us by. And then, uh, I found music. Like my cousins were into Metallica and Pantera. And I started getting into that and I liked grunge. And then obviously I'm from the birthplace of hip hop. So everybody was into rap. So, you know, music just took a big form of my life. And I think, you know, it's like I call it the 1994 effect because in 1994, almost all like, you know, the downward spiral from Nine Inch Nails came out. Ready to Die, Biggie Smalls came out. Um, Far Beyond Driven from Pantera came out. Machine Heads, Burn My Eyes, Korn's debut album, you know, <laughs> Fear Factory dropped in Manufacture. So like all these kind of, um, you know, legacy albums all seem to pop out at the same time. Marilyn Manson released uh, um, Portrait of American Family that year. So it was kind of like in the, you know, there was still MTV still played music too. <laughs> they didn't just have TV shows. And, yeah. and so, uh, you know, all that stuff kind of, I got, you know, enraveled in, in the mixed culture of, of music. And I had uh, my, my aunt and uncle lived next to a kid who had a band and they played in his garage. And one day I went over there and auditioned and I joined the band and been going ever since. Wow. That's incredible. That's incredible. Especially where you're from. What about, um, the groups that you've been in? Obviously, um, where you, where, I guess where you became obviously into the heavy metal scene, where the band, and when you join these groups, how they transpire? Uh, well, I, I mean, I did bands pretty much my whole entire adolescence. And then when I was about 24, I joined a band called Divine Heresy. And I had auditioned online, and they lived in California. And it was uh, Dino from Fear Factory, Tim, the drummer Morbid Angel, and Joe from Nile. So these were all like very extreme death metal background guys, and I was more of a metalcore like Killswitch and Pantera influence, you know, and Fear Factory and Meshuggah and stuff. So I I wound up going to California. I literally, you know, packed a bag and I had three hundred bucks saved up, and and then moved to California like, like a twenty four year old would. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I got jobs, and I, I got jobs working at nightclubs, and I slept in my friend's closet at his house because that was the only place that he had for me to sleep. <laughs> and uh, we made a record, and then Divine Heresy came out, and uh, we got signed to Roadrunner, and that was the first time I went to Australia. So we we got booked to play um, Soundwave Festival in two thousand eight, and so we came out there on that tour, and uh, thanks. That band didn't really last too long. Me and the, the guitar player really butted heads a lot. And this was before I got sober. And so I was drinking and, and I was just not in a good spot. And we didn't want to get into a fight. And basically, I, I left that band. And then I joined another band called Snot. And Snot was a band from the 90s that I'd gone, I grew up going to see. And the singer had died, Lynn Strait. He had died in a car accident in 1998. So now it was 2008 and it was the 10 year anniversary. So I auditioned for that band. I, I was such a fanboy. Like I already knew every word and I went to the auditions and I, I booked that, that gig and, uh, and then went on, just went on tour from there. And one of the, the guitar players in the band had been sober for seven years at the time. He's sober 19 years now. And. You know, he. I think he recognized that, like, my drinking and drugging was a serious problem. And about a year of being in the band, I asked him for help. And and that's kind of how, you know, that was 12 years ago. And uh, that's how I got into recovery. And that really changed my life a lot. You know, and then I, she, I, I basically took my first year of recovery off from the music industry. And uh, I got a year sober. I wound up moving back to New York City to try to be be more of service and more available for my family. And um, 
you know, in September of 2010, I was actually murdered during a home invasion. So, uh, there's a song on the Bad Wolves record called Remember When, and the video was shot by Wayne Isham, um, who's worked with like Backstreet Boys and Michael Jackson and Britney Spears. And it was, it's an autobiographical story about what happened because, um, it was my twin brother who was strung out on drugs that assaulted me and almost killed me. And so he, uh, beat me with a crowbar, uh, broke my left arm, fractured my skull, and my spleen was uh, ruptured. And so, uh, I died in the ER. They brought me back to life. I had emergency surgery and, uh, it was just kind of a wild ride from there. And then I can't, and then I wound up, you know, going through that whole process. I stayed sober. Um, you know, my brother, unfortunately is serving 20 years for attempted murder in prison. And, uh, we never really reconciled after all that. And, I moved back to California to start a nonprofit organization. Started doing snot shows again. Went in the studio with Bill from Trans Siberian Orchestra. Made the Westfield Massacre record. Went on tour with that. Five Finger Death Punch called me. They asked me if I could, if I was still in, in in that whole interim. I became a public speaker, and then I became a, a drug and alcohol counselor. So when I wasn't touring. I ran a men's rehab facility in Santa Monica called Madden House, and I was doing sober coaching. So I, I got to work with actually a couple of like really high A-list celebrities, and I lived with them and helped them get through their first 30 to 60 days clean. And so that job funded all my recording projects. And then Five Finger Death Punch called me. I remember Zoltan called me in, in April of, of 2017 and asked if I was still doing sober coaching because we, we don't, we've known each other for probably 15 years. And I said, yeah. And they asked me to come hang out with Ivan and, and try to help him get sober. And so I said, okay. So I wound up going on tour with Five Finger. Uh, we went on tour for a month together. And uh, Ivan was really having a hard time. And, you know, we went out, we came back home for a couple of weeks and then went to Europe. And a few days into the European tour, he he had cut, drank so much, he had to go to the hospital. So the band was in this position where they either had to cancel the tour or find somebody to fill in. And since I already was a, a heavy metal singer, they were like, all right, can you just do it? So. I basically had a few days to learn all the songs. And then all of a sudden I was like singing in five finger death punch. Like, so I went from playing the Viper room to, you know, playing with Lincoln park at Hellfest in front of 250,000 people. You wow. know, that's incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. So, and then, um, and bad wolves was like one of my, it was a, a like a music project that I'd been working on. Uh, with John from Devil Driver, and he and the and the studio guitar player Max Karen, uh, who's he actually is a guitar tech for Faith No More, and so um, the record label was so impressed with the way that I took over for the shows that they they signed me, and uh, Westville Massacre and I wound up, wound up parting ways and I did Bad Wolves full time. And then so Bad Wolves got the record deal. And, um, you know, I had recorded a version of Zombie and I brought that in. And the Dan Wade at the record label was friends with Dolores and sent it to her. And then she wanted to sing on it. And most, as most people know, the story with Zombie that, you know, Dolores was scheduled to record the song. Uh, and she flew to, we flew her to London and she actually died the night before she was scheduled to record tragically. So, you know, we got, I got the call the next morning and, you know, I talked to the label and we had a decision to make of whether we should, you know, shelf the song or put it out. And, you know, I told them, I don't, I don't want any money. Like it doesn't, like, it doesn't feel like, 
like this is the right thing to do unless we give all the money to our kids. So that's what we did. We started a trust and all the proceeds from the recordings uh, that I would have made, I donated to her children. And then the song went, wound up going viral and then, you know, million, millions and millions of copies later and, you know, billions of streams, uh, you know, and then it was, uh, it was the biggest rock song in, I think in 12 years when it came out in 2018, it was the, the most sold single in rock in the past 12 years. Wow, that's incredible. And yeah, I love that song too, that you did done, Zombie. Like, it's amazing, mate. But it's really incredibly done as well. I really like that. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. What are, um, what are some of the key learnings that I guess you've taken out of your career so far that really stand out for you? Um, I mean, unfortunately, I've learned that, you know, and I've, I've owned, I've had my own business before, so, you know, when I was a sober coach, I wound up opening up my own company and then I took on other coaches and put them with clients and managed them. And I think the music industry, how it's different is it's the only business where you're allowed to be ripped off and it's, everyone's like, oh, it's like not a big deal, you know? And so unfortunately the artists are normally not business savvy and so they get taken advantage of and there are a lot of backdoor deals and you know lawyers in will will work as a and r and then they'll be you know trying to get their artists to sign with a label but it's in their own best interest because they're getting paid on the side to go scout out on you know and it's just like a lot of shady shit that goes on so the, the record labels will spend money from your budget thinking you don't know that you have to pay it back and they and they kind of in order to control the artists they they keep you in debt so they make a debt racket so you're kind of never okay so you keep having to go in the studio you can never really take a vacation and take a break um and that's just kind of how they they put people to work so it's it's not um i I wouldn't recommend it, you know, as, as somebody who's had, you know, gold and platinum and, and diamond and double platinum success, I still would not recommend it because I, when I, I, the funny thing was, is I, I left when the band split in January, I, you know, I focused on starting a merchandise company and, and then, uh, I did a GoFundMe to fund my album. And in, in the first three months of 2021, I, I had brought in more money than four years of being on a major label. It's that severe, the, the financial extraction. Um, you know, and the, the problem is, is that the psychology of the managers and the labels, oh, well, in, in this in particular, better noise music is that they, they kind of abuse you and then expect you to be grateful. So it, when you know accounting and, and you, you know, you're looking at spreadsheets and you're looking at expenses and you're seeing all these mistakes being done and you're calling it out, they're like, well, you should just be grateful. Like, look at all the success we got. I'm, I'm like, well, I provide the material that is successful. Yeah. You know what I mean? So why don't I get paid? You know, so it, it's a, it's definitely a treacherous industry, you know, and I, I think that any, any musicians that are serious about their career, I think that it would do any artist a great deal, um, a great deal of service to read legal volumes on the music industry so they can get antiquated with what all the tricks and all the, all the ways that they're going to potentially attempt to take advantage of you if you're not well versed in, in how the industry works. Yeah, that's really great advice. Um, yeah, hundred percent. Think that's that's really great advice. What um, tell me about the process of the songs that you've written and that you're going to obviously write in the future. What makes a good song? How do you how do you get your inspiration and motivation to write the songs? Um, I mean, I. I predominantly in, in Bad Wolves, 
Um, so songs like like Zombie I did with my buddy Philip Naslin, who's a Swedish producer, uh, and we we actually put that idea together uh, in 2016. And so I was sitting on it for a while, and, and you know I brought, and then when obviously when I signed with the label, I brought it to them as a potential single, and they thought it was great, you know. And then uh, it was interesting because the band, the guys in the band, didn't want to have a cover on the record to begin with, and so I was kind of like, if I could get her to sing on it, then they'll be okay with it, you know. Uh, but then songs like Remember When, uh, I wrote with Drew Falk, who's a, uh, he's a producer and a, and a, a songwriter. Zoltan Bathory actually helped a little bit with the, with the format of the song. Uh, Sober is a song that I did with Drew. Killing Me Slowly is a song that I did with Drew. Hear Me Now is a song that, uh, the top line was written by a guy named Brandon Sammons. It, it originally was just piano and a vocal. Um, and then I, I, I took it and redid the whole thing and then brought it to Max, our studio guitar player, then took it to Philip and then had Diamante sing on it. You know, I, I had played it for the CEO of the label and he wanted to, you know, help get his artist trajectory. So we ended up making it a duet. Yeah. And, uh, there's, you know, there's all different ways that sometimes, you know, my drummer would write songs with Max and they would just send me the songs and I'll, I'll sing on them, but I'll also edit them because there might be too many parts or it might be meandering and kind of condense and cut the fat out and trim it because I, I have a good, like, overview of how the song should flow. I think sometimes instrumentalists they get too inside their head when they're so close to it and the things that they think are super intricate and important to the song the average listener doesn't even know what that is you know or it or it messes with their focus or their attention so you know there's just all different kinds of ways awesome what uh what inspires you daily i mean right now you know i mean i think everybody Who's go, you know, I think the, the, everybody who's gone through, you know, 2020 and 2021 can relate to, you know, the mental health aspect of what COVID has done to us and how we feel separated from our loved ones. And, you know, I mean, a lot for the lockdown, you know, that the, the definition of a lockdown is a course of action to ensure containment of prisoners. That's the actual, Webster's Dictionary definition of a lockdown. Yeah. So, you know, people feel like they're in prison, you know, and it's, it's kind of, it's kind of hard. And I think I've always been an advocate for mental health. Uh, you know, I've, I'm an attempted suicide survivor and uh, anti suicide has been a big part of my songs and a big part of my, my, what I talk about on stage. And I think, you know, I, people, you know, when I was, going through the worst times of my life, it was music that pulled me through it and, and the people that I looked up to that made it. And so I think artists definitely have a social responsibility. And I think that's just kind of what has motivated me. I, I wound up making four albums during quarantine. You know, I did a double covers album and then I recorded and wrote 90% of the new Bad Wolves record. And then when the band had the split they confiscated all my songs and and got a new singer to re-sing them. So I went in the studio and I made a whole other record. So I just stay busy, you know, that's, I think, you know, I think that uh, telling the truth is the most important thing that I can do. And so I try to do that with my platform. I try to do that with my music. It gets a little bit more and more difficult. Um, you know, because I I never shy away from touching on hot topics, and I think that humanity is better when we're able to have those discussions. Yeah, for sure. What's the what's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice? Yeah. Um, courage is not the absence of fear. 
Nice. You know? So it's it's like anything that you know, you don't need courage to do something you're not afraid of. You need courage in the face of fear. And I think you know a decision to be courageous when there is a high risk builds character. It it says a lot about who you are. Yeah, for sure. Tell me about um your Salt Lake right now and what you're currently up to. Uh, I mean, basically, I have a, a few things going on. So, you know, I did I did 22 covers in 2020, and we're currently fighting over who's going to, you know, who's going to release them, and am I going to get them, and that's uh, part of the legal battle with the label, as well as a bunch of songs that were written for Bad Wolves that they've confiscated, um, whether I'm going to get ownership of those again. And then uh, I've just been busy working on material. You know, I, I want to... I just want to stretch. You know, I think once I'm free, I won't have so many boundaries and I don't have to specifically do rock or specifically do this. There's a lot of hip hop artists that want me to do collaborations. Um, and I, and I, with, without a label, I can, col- I can collaborate with whatever artist I want to, you know, I, I, you know, I got Buster Rhymes in my DMs asking me about stuff and he's like one of my favorite rapper of all time, but I can't do anything because the label has the potentiality to ruin it, you know? And so they're, you know, unfortunately, in this industry, there is very, slavery is very much alive and well. And a lot of these CEOs view their artists as slaves. And they want you to say what they want. They want you to do what they want. They want you to represent and speak on behalf of the views that they want. And the problem is, is that as me, for me, coming from a work as being a working class family, um, and I don't have the same values as someone who was born with a with a billionaire father. I don't have the same values of someone who was born rich. The things that are important to me are not important to. It's not the same as what's important to someone who's never known struggle, you know, or never known hardship. And I think that it's increasingly frustrating for people who are born with a silver spoon and have a lot of money and power and are very spoiled to understand the needs of the everyday man, woman, and child because they're so separated from us. And I think that's that's where the disconnect happens in the industry, unfortunately. Yeah, that's really, really good uh, insights. Well, um, you've obviously done a bit of touring. What's some of the best tours and best memories you can recall so far? Oh, I've had so many. Um, I mean, we we toured in Australia. We did three shows uh, with Bad Wolves. We did three shows with Nickelback. And I had actually just been in Australia because my my ex girlfriend's from Brisbane, so I was spending a lot of off time there. And I I completely fell in love with with the country, and I made so many friends. And you know, I think uh, Australia is a very special place to me. I, the people are very special, and I think I I feel like Americans could learn a lot from Australians on how you guys deal with each other and treat each other. And it's just a very um, it's just a more easygoing place, you know. I feel like people are are you know less drama and, and more about what's important in life, um, especially versus Los Angeles. <laughs> so. Uh, I definitely, yeah, like, I definitely have great memories of Australia. I definitely loved going to Europe, you know, the past, um, the last tour I did with Bad Wolves in Europe was with Megadeth, and, you know, Dave is, is, you know, uh, Dave Ellison, the bass player of Megadeth, is like a mentor of mine, and Five Finger Death Punch was on the tour, and, you know, I, I I had taken a girl that I was dating with me for two weeks on the on the European tour. She had never been to Europe, so it's also exciting when you get to share stuff like that with somebody who's never been there because it makes it new all over again for you. You know, so that I think it was, you know, it was, I think it was cool. It was like we had a really good time. It was comfortable, and 
we got to play Wembley for the first time. You know, and I, I don't know. I just, I, I think too, like in 2020, in April of 2020, I, I played uh, a small tour in Texas as a, as a solo artist. And I think the first show, you know, I hadn't stepped on a stage in, in like 16 months. And I broke down crying on stage. You know, at the end of the set, I just was like so, you know, there was like a thousand people there. It wasn't like a big, huge show, but it was, it was just like, you could feel the energy in the room of how much people needed to be together again, you know, and to experience music again and to, to connect, you know, we're not supposed to be separated from each other. We're not meant to be in cubicles or, or live on the internet. You know, we, we have to touch base. We have to have contact. That's what makes our lives good. 100%. Well, you know, we're a social species. We need to be connected. So I couldn't agree more with you, but that is so true. If you were, if you could go back in time and you were 18 again and you could change anything, what would you change? Oh, well, if I could change anything? Yeah. I mean, I would have, uh, you know, I, I didn't have very much direction. You know, my family was a broken family. My dad, uh, kind of, he relapsed into alcoholism when I was about 13 or 14. And then my mom, uh, my sister left, you know, and, and so I kind of was like left to fend for myself. And I got involved in a lot of, you know, bullshit, to be honest. You know, I was hanging out in the streets with the wrong kinds of people, doing the wrong kinds of things, getting in trouble. And I didn't have anybody older than me who cared to tell me to do better. And I think that if I could go back, I probably would have gave myself some structure and saved myself a lot of, uh, a lot of scrapes and bruises, so to speak. Yeah, that's really good. And where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, what does the future look like? For me? Oh, I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. I feel like the future is so uncertain. You know? I think I think America is going to have a revolutionary war. I think there's going to be in the next year, probably in the next 18 months to two years, the I, you, I can feel the temperature, you know, and people are, people are really, really angry and there's a lot of confusion still. And, uh, I just think it's gonna, it's, it's boiling up, you know, and the, and the media has done a fantastic job in America of completely dividing the country, uh, to the point where, you know, they, it, it, you know, it's almost like, they have, there is like a whole generation of kids who hate America, but they don't know anything else, you know? So it's, it's kind of strange to me. So I don't know where I'll be in 10 years. I'll, I'll probably live in the woods in the middle of nowhere you know I mean? <laughs> with a family and guns and farm my own vegetables. <laughs> like, to be honest, I'm, I'm just kind of like, I've lived a really interesting life and, I'm not an old man yet, but I have like old man soul, and I just like want to be all away from everybody. <laughs> I, I just want to work out every day and go be in nature and you know eat steak. <laughs> That's it. Nice, nice. Um, Tommy, thanks for coming on the podcast. I do appreciate it. Um, I think you've done amazing things, and your trajectory too with what you're doing is amazing. And yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Uh.